Good morning, and thank you to the Library Press uh, Coalition and to all of you for being here today. I'm very happy to be here with Charles Watkinson and Catherine Miller uh, to present on Library Press Collaboration and the Future of the Monograph. I'll start off this morning's panel with a summary of some questions and challenges for the future of scholarly publishing and for the monograph in particular. And I'll then turn to what the monograph of the future might look like and how presses, libraries, and other organizations might collaborate to publish in new ways. Lastly, I will address some additional research questions and highlight the recent grants that the Mellon Foundation has made in this area. And I just realized I didn't introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kristen Rotana Therathorn, and I'm with the Scholarly Communications Program at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So, what does the future hold for the monograph, currently conceived of as a book-length work of original research written primarily for a scholarly or professional readership? When we think about its future, we are confronted with a number of questions about the monograph. First, what are the unique challenges for publishing monographs electronically? In general, it seems that books are less commonly published in library publishing environments than journals are. So then are the humanities whose primary medium of publishing is the monograph, are they being left behind in uh, online publishing environments and in the open access movement? And if so, what can we do to support those mediums uh, that are most common in the humanities so that they don't get left behind? Are there or might there be other long form genres other than the monograph? Could the monograph evolve to a point where it's no longer considered a monograph? And if that happens, would the definition of what is a monograph, would that change? What infrastructure, be it technological or organizational, what infrastructure is necessary for uh, publishing monographs electronically? And how can collaborations between libraries, presses, and other organizations uh, continue to support monograph publishing in the future? So in thinking about the structure of the monograph and what infrastructure might be necessary to support it, we should also try to envision what the book of the future might look like. So it should be a high quality publication, peer reviewed, and not simply a PDF of a work that was written for print. It would thrive in an online environment, uh, interacting with primary sources and other related materials, and authors would be able to read and incorporate reader comments. Publishing in digital formats allows the collection of metrics about readers, readers and their use of the book. The monograph of the future should allow the collection and interpretation of those metrics and also enhance the reader experience by in incorporating capabilities such as annotation. The monograph of the future should be eligible for disciplinary prizes and awards and hopefully it would be winning some of them. And then the digital content that's contained within the book, including audiovisual components, dynamic visualizations, and other born digital content should be able to be maintained and preserved for the long term. The most thorny of the questions, uh, the monograph should be, the publishing a monograph in the future should be an economically sustainable enterprise. So there are a number of ways this could be done. Um, one possibility would be for universities to provide authors with funding to publish their books digitally. But there are many challenges to this approach, including finding those funds within the institution and then justifying their use for this purpose. How much support would be needed? And could you charge for specific services such as peer review, manuscript preparation, marketing, and dissemination? Finally, the monograph of the future should be shared with a wide audience. So what roles can all of us, libraries, presses, institutions, and other partners play in the future of monograph publishing? Who has the skills, expertise, and interest in participating in order to move us forward in this area? There are many complementarities between libraries and presses. Publishers know how to market books, and libraries know how to manage and store information over time. Both types of organizations have expertise in selecting works, and that helps with field building. 
But when we think of uh, roles traditionally embodied by presses, we might think of book production workflows. And for libraries, we may think of technology skills and development and project management. However, there seems to be a bleeding of these skills uh, now, in general, pushing towards a middle sphere and away from distinct skills and roles uh, between these two organizations. As for institutions, universities and colleges have substantial interest in promoting their faculty and the fields that they represent. So these interests could represent a sustainable source of income for monographic publishing, where sponsorship of publication could translate institutional interests into first-class digital works. Other points of collaboration between these three groups and also other partners are already underway, and they include technology development, image management, and preservation. So today, academic presses are faced with a number of challenges, including declining revenues, diminishing sources of subsidy, increasing calls for open access, and limited resources for experimenting with new digital publishing workflows, models, business models, and uh, marketing strategies. So as part of the Mellon Foundation's strategic planning process, which we underwent in 2013 and 2014, the Scholarly Communications Program, my program, identified a number of unanswered questions and areas for further research in which we could invest. So one of the questions was, how many monographs are published and in what fields? We are most interested in the humanities at the Mellon Foundation, but we kind of wanted to get a, an idea of what the field was publishing each year. What are the costs involved in publishing a digital book? What features and tools are necessary? What are the appropriate assessment and evaluation criteria for a digital work? And what are the implications for the promotion and tenure process? And finally, perhaps most importantly, are the key players ready to move forward? The Mellon Foundation is currently supporting long-form publishing in the humanities in four broad areas. Research studies, business modeling, assessment and evaluation, and perhaps most important to today's panel, collaborative infrastructure development. So to help understand the volume of monographs published each year in the humanities fields, the foundation commissioned a study in 2013 by Joseph Esposito on the output of American University Presses. His study estimated that American University Presses publish about 2,900 monographs per year in the humanities. Ithaca SNR is collaborating with the Association of American University Presses to get a better idea of what the costs of publishing a digital monograph would be. And we, the Mellon Foundation is also funding studies at Indiana, Michigan, and Emory to develop scenarios under which institutions could fund publication of works by their faculty. Those are all still underway, so I don't have any answers for you yet. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, the Modern Language Association developed guidelines for the evaluation of digital scholarship, so they were really ahead of the game. And uh, in 2014, the Mellon Foundation funded the American Historical Association and the College Art Association in collaboration with the Society of Architectural Historians to develop guidelines, similar efforts for evaluating digital scholarship. In the collaborative infrastructure area, two grants I'd like to highlight uh, were to Brown and Stanford universities to encourage collaboration in digital publishing. Brown is currently developing guidelines for reviewing digital projects for promotion and tenure and extending the library's role in digital publishing. So the university is hiring a digital editor who would help faculty uh, develop their digital projects and also find avenues for publication, even though Brown doesn't have its own academic press. Stanford University and Stanford University Press are acquiring high quality interactive scholarly works for peer review, editing, publishing, and marketing, and partnering, partnering with the library to provide long-term preservation for the publications in its digital repository. So you might be asking yourself, what exactly is an interactive scholarly work? And it is what maybe the monograph of the future might look like. It's a new kind of long form digital publication that depends on the interactive features of the web. Typically these publications would include links to related secondary sources on the web, primary sources as well, 
visualizations, and software tools that would allow readers not only to search and browse, but also to analyze the underlying data that's contained within the work. Other recent grants that Mellon has made in this area include a grant to UNC Press, University of North Carolina Press, to extend its Longleaf Book Warehousing and Distribution Services to include editorial, design, production, business operations, and marketing services for other university presses. A collaboration between the University of California Press and the California Digital Library to create a web-based open source publishing platform and a grant to Yale University Press to select a platform to publish 25 of its backlist titles from the press and from its museum partner, the Art Institute of Chicago. So early in 2014, Mellon staff identified press leaders in digital publication, and those were the ones I just mentioned on the previous slides, uh, University of California, Stanford, UNC, and Yale, to help them accelerate their digital publishing activities and build up their infrastructure. In addition, in May of last year, staff issued a call to all other U.S. university presses. They issued an invitation to submit statements of interest for collaborative projects that would significantly enhance their ability to support the editing, production, marketing, dissemination, and discovery of long-form digital publications in the humanities. Mellon staff and external reviewers reviewed all of the submissions and invited five of them to submit full proposals. At our trustees meeting two weeks ago, uh, three grants were approved and a fourth proposal is still pending and a fifth proposal is still in development. So the three grants that were made in March include a grant to the University of Minnesota Press to develop a platform for iterative scholarly monographs, which would incorporate reader comments. They're also creating guidelines for submitting the iterative works. New York University is developing a discovery and reading platform that would incorporate multimedia content and archival links, tools to measure usage and reader engagement and tagging of key concepts. And finally, the University of Michigan Press is disseminating and preserving digital monographs and their associated data sets and media content, as well as exploring fee-for-service and business planning components of that process. So as the projects I've mentioned demonstrate, the monograph of the future is a high quality product. It interacts with related materials, it allows for measuring use and facilitating annotation, and it should be eligible for disciplinary prizes and awards. The challenge will be to ensure that these works are broadly disseminated and accessible, and that their digital content be maintained and preserved for the long term, all in an economically sustainable fashion. So it's no small task, but I think we're up to the challenge, and I look forward to learning more over the next two days. Thanks to everyone who contributed and helped with this presentation and to all of the projects that I mentioned. Please feel free to contact me. Uh, I have my Twitter handle there as well. And I think I can take a few burning questions, and if not, we'll wait till the end of the panel. Any burning, one burning question? I can hear you. <laughs> Um, well, now, what interests me about this is, is there is, of course, um, almost a precedent for attempts at, at modernizing types of scholarly communication, particularly, I'm thinking, um, with Wiley's Anywhere article and mm -hmm. uh, Article of the Future from Elsevier, and there's a, there's a number of them that have tried to, Lens is another one for me, like that's a really good one, uh, they've tried to kind of uh, take this kind of flat, dead, printed PDF format and turn it into something interactive, create links to, to you know, supporting information or for you know, downstream mentions and impact and all the rest of it. And they have been um, of mixed success, mm -hmm. let's say. And the, the key problem seems to be that researchers, um, particularly in the sciences, I suppose, and perhaps it's true in the, in the humanities as well, want that portable version. They want something that they can download onto their own hard drive and keep. There's a sense of ownership associated with that, that having access to an HTML version doesn't seem to give them. And they've been very resistant, even when presented with you know, extremely functional um, modernizations of the article to move over to 
to, to move away from the PDF. So is there a thought about, do you have any thoughts about making the article of the future, the monograph of the future, portable in that way? Uh, I think that we're hoping so. At least at the foundation, we haven't come across, I think, any really good examples of that. Um, there could be, I think the ideal situation would be for there to be maybe the, you know, the full book the, with all the interactivity available on the web, and then maybe derivative versions that could be downloaded. But then you do lose some of that functionality. So I think it's an open question. Very quick question. I'm Gail McMillan from Virginia Tech. When you say um, that these monographs should be widely available, mm -hmm. I didn't hear you say publicly available or openly available. So how widely available is Mellon looking for? That's a very good question. And it was just deliberately vague, I guess. Um, we have tried to stay away from specific licenses for open access um, because we haven't really found that there's one ideal yet. Um, but I think that as widely available as possible and publicly available are the goals that we're looking for, but we don't want to limit the projects that we can fund in that way by requiring a certain license. Okay, thank you. Something mysterious is happening behind the curtain. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, thanks for coming or staying. Uh, it's always great to present in the room where the coffee was. Um, and uh, thanks to Kristen for setting up this panel um, and the discussions that that um, Charles and I are going to to be uh, engaging and following. Um, then thanks to Mellon for funding <laughs> what we're doing. Um, and uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Catherine Mitchell, and I'm the director of access and publishing at the California Digital Library at the University of California. And I'll be talking today about um, a particular um, project that we are involved in with UC Press in, in the efforts to tackle the humanities book crisis. Um, and Eric Van Ryn, uh, my co-conspirator in this project, is sitting at the front and has promised to answer all the hard questions. He's the assistant director and director of publishing operations at UC Press. So please uh, direct your hard questions. R raise your hand, Eric. There you go. Hard questions to him. Um, so this is a talk about infrastructure. Um, it's about the core tools that we need to begin to address the crisis in humanities book publishing. Unfortunately, the word infra infrastructure is not that sexy. Uh, people tend not to get jazzed about it. It doesn't get, capture the imagination necessarily. It's certainly not trending on Twitter. Um, to use an example from the land of seismic instability from whence we hail, uh, it's about tending to the cracks in your foundation when what you'd really rather do is paint the walls that cool lime green color that matches your favorite t-shirt. Um, infrastructure is dreary, but without it, and in this case I mean without robust open source web-based content and workflow management systems to aid in the publication of scholarly monographs, our academic publishing house is gravely at risk. So let's talk about risk, because that's so much more fun than talking about infrastructure. What are the perils that threaten the existence of the book, and in particular, the humanities monograph? Well, for one thing, its death as a material object has already been widely reported. The scholarly monograph sells on average 400 copies these days, and many monographs sell far fewer, relegating themselves to the realm of the arcane and the inaccessible. Then there are the scholars who increasingly are frustrated by the limitations of the book, especially those involved in research projects that are not constrained by the necessary limitations of the print book technology. These scholars want their books to be filled with multimedia. 
geospatial mapping. Sorry. Text mining visualizations and 3D modeling. And this is the interactive networked text that uh, we're imagining is the next iteration of the book and any publication for that matter. And yet students have begun reporting a preference for print books as the most efficacious mechanism for learning. Following her recent study, survey of over 300 students in the US, Japan, Germany, and Slovakia, Naomi Barron, professor of linguistics at American University, reports that 92% of students believe that they concentrate best when reading academic material in hard copy, as opposed to on a mobile device, a tablet, an e-reader, or a laptop. And the vast, vast majority of humanities faculty are still perfectly content with the traditional model of long form, even print-based argumentation, without any particular technological bells and whistles. There is no question that the market for ebooks continues to grow. It's moving up at a really nice uh, upward trend. But clearly, print is still integral to the future of the monograph, at least for now. Throw into the mix labyrinthine and inefficient book production systems that were designed for print only publishing environments and have since been jerry rigged to accommodate new models along with a soupçon of faculty anxiety about the challenge of landing a book contract in this strained publishing environment, and you have the makings of a true humanities book crisis. Presses don't want to publish many monographs. They're too expensive and there are too few sales. Libraries don't want to buy many monographs because they're too expensive and there are too few readers. Authors continue to produce monographs as markers, primary markers, of their professional bona fides, some of which are revolutionary in their design, but most of which are quite traditional in their conception and form. And readers want easy access, and they want multiple formats. The consequences of this crisis? An economically unsustainable system which results in limited book publishing opportunities for a profession that measures its legitimacy in large part by the publication of monographs. And perhaps even more troubling, by virtue of its economic constraints, the system results in less access, fewer people reading the work of humanities researchers, resulting in less rich and less inclusive scholarly conversation. So what do we do? How do we resolve these contradictory and competing pressures? We must, as libraries and presses, find a way to support sustainably a diverse marketplace of publications and modes of distribution. It's not about figuring out what the next thing is. It's about figuring out how you do the next thing while you do the previous five things, and you do them all well. Hence the establishment of a joint University of California Press, California Digital Library project funded by the Mellon Foundation to develop a web-based content management system for books. The primary goal of this project is to streamline and enhance the production of scholarly monographs through the development of a non-commercial, end-to-end system that will enable web-based authoring and collaboration, workflow management, and flexible outputs for final publication. What's to be gained from this kind of system? Why are we motivated to do this, and why, why has Mellon taken a chance on us? Well, first of all, there is the liberation from production systems that are stubbornly geared toward typeset pages and thus ill-suited for digital-first publications. Our legacy infrastructure is significantly behind the times in many cases, and to catch up via commercial products is prohibitively expensive for academic presses and for libraries. We also have the opportunity to develop robust born digital tools and features akin to the high cost systems utilized by commercial publishers, but without the price tag. There are a lot of VC funded efforts to develop platforms in this space right now, which are resulting in more and more commercial products that prove to be costly solutions for academic presses and libraries and thereby raise the BPC required for academic publishers to break even and it's too expensive for most humanists to pay. Um, we also envision a collaborative authoring and editing environment that supports the production of networked digital publications. This is potentially transformative. 
It means doing away with the limitations of the manuscripts circulating in the ether and opening up a web-based space for authors and editors to collaborate in real time on the content of the book. And those are the three. In other words, we are specifically looking to establish the infrastructure necessary for academic pre presses and library publishers to support high quality, vibrant, and sustainable humanities book publishing programs with the flexibility to evolve uh, along with the technology of the book. Here are some of the features of the system that we are building. Um, rich metadata support, including semantic tagging. Uh, we want these, these, these books to live in an environment, not to be the, the, the PDF, the constrained PDF. Um, at the same time, we don't want to um, foreclose on the possibility of that document existing independently, but we want it in its fullest form to be networked. Um, no typesetting. And um, we have calculated that there should be a cost savings of between $250 and $5 a page for a typical monograph when you take that out of the mix. Um, we want the system to scale to support low-cost gold OA models, as well as enabling the production of print-on-demand editions and downloadable files. So this is where the diversity of modes that comes in, and I'll be talking a little bit more about the Gold OA projects that we are particularly interested in supporting with this, with the system. XML HTML ready text for publication on the web, no expert XML knowledge required, that sounds tantalizing, um, and support for additional end user scholarly communication tools such as annotation services. So this is really about bringing the book into um, our, our current conversation and ways of, of interacting with, with text. Um, Microsoft Word ingest. So we imagine this sort of wonderful place where everyone is collaborating and writing um, simultaneously, editing, writing. It's, it's a beautiful vision and highly unlikely, at least initially. Um, so we also think it's very important to have a, a Word ingest engine that can um, bring documents into the system when they've already been authored in, in Microsoft Word. Task management, uh, features and alerts to keep everybody on task um, without circulating files. And it's going to be open source code, so this is about building something for the community. I felt like I wanted to put a heart on this one because things have been so great lately. <laughs> um, so why the press and the library together working on this? Well, we have complementary skill sets and expertise. Uh, I think Kristen was talking about that a bit in her talk and how those, those spaces are sort of converging. But we still have, you know, we still have um, the presses with a long history of editorial practice, vetting, the conferral of legitimacy, and libraries with a long history of working directly with the faculty to increase the visibility of their work, um, to support new scholarly communications models, and in the case of the California Digital Library, a very robust technical infrastructure, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of expertise there. We're both non-commercial, mission-driven organizations. That is, we have no money. Um, the press has a little bit more money than the library does, but the press works really hard to get that money and to break even. This is non-commercial, um, non-profit. We have a shared interest in building the infrastructure to support humanities research. There's a lot of infrastructure out there to support STEM work. Um, there is not a lot of infrastructure for humanities research, and uh, this is something that we are really mission-driven to support. Um, and we both need this kind of platform to support our own open access humanities book publishing programs. Just a word about these programs that we hope the system will become the back end infrastructure for. Um, Luminos, you may have heard that UC Press has recently um, announced the, uh, the um, uh, Luminos book publishing effort, which is an open access uh, book publishing system, not system, it's an open access book publishing list. Um, these monographs are, are to be available free of charge in multiple digital formats. Um, they'll also be available through print on demand. The revenue to support the production of these books um, will come from a title publication fee, that is the fee paid by the author or the department, um, a UC Press subsidy, library contributions, um, I think somewhat akin to what Martin Eve was talking about. These are libraries as supporting organizations rather than libraries who are paying for particular titles. Um, and incremental revenue from POD. These publications will be peer reviewed and will be reviewed by the press's editorial committee and will carry the press's imprint. 
So all of those markers of legitimacy. Um, at the same time, my uh, publishing program, eScholarship at the CDL, um, is looking to increase upstream services for the authors and editors of its eScholarship open access book series. And these are book series that um, live in eScholarship and carry their own imprint. In, in other words, these are book series that are uh, produced and maintained by the faculty of the University of California. Um, they are um, the faculty function as the editorial board, uh, they and their colleagues around the world, um, and as the editors of the series. And how we currently support this is simply by giving them a place to put their PDFs once they have managed to produce something um, through various kludgy um, systems. Um, but what we don't have yet is a back-end system where they can build those, those uh, books and, and build them in a robust way. So there's a real untapped potential there because there are a lot of folks who publish books without publishers who rely on their own academic um, standing and legitimacy as the markers of, of, of value, especially among senior faculty. And so having the, enough infrastructure to support that kind of work uh, we think is really important. This is our advisory board. Um, we are delighted to have every one of these folks involved in our project. Um, and we think that it will benefit enormously from their, both their uh, expert uh, input and also their involvement in a lot of other things that are happening right now. So it's early days for the project. We're on a two-year grant. Um, we're in the middle of conce concept development and require requirements gathering right now. And I just want to call out uh, the project manager for this, um, for this effort, Justin Gonder. Raise your hand. He's over there in the white shirt. He's gathering requirements, so if you have any requirements, go to him, and he will gather them. Um, what we do know right now at this stage, even now, as I have said, is that there's a need for shared platforms, um, for a network of shared infrastructure that creates the flexibility to innovate while working towards sustainable models of scholarly publishing. We want to leverage and build upon extant technologies wherever possible. The goal here is not to build something idiosyncratic that is unique to our concerns. It's about leveraging what's out there already, making connections, and building something that, that will be of value to the larger community. And we're hiring. Um, if you know any really awesome developers who have great people skills, um, please send them our way, and uh, we would love to, to talk to them. If you have any questions, you can reach Eric directly, remember, for the hard questions, and, um, and myself. Thank you very much. So I guess I should ask at this point whether there are any burning questions before we move on to Charles's presentation. Hi, Catherine. Uh, Sean Sutton, Oregon State. And this may be a handoff to Eric, but do you have a ballpark um, fee, publishing BPC, basically, in mind for the Luminos project? And if so, what are the factors playing into where that ballpark is? Eric, do you, do you want to come up here, Eric, actually? So um, the Luminos BPC um, is set uh, based upon, uh, you know, a certain, you know, minimal manuscript length um, at $7,500, and that would be the faculty contribution to the BPC. Um, that is not the overall cost of publishing a monograph. In fact, we think it's probably about half of that. Um, and, you know, obviously the cost of publishing monograph scales um, by the number of, uh, of printed pages and the number of words in the monograph. Um, so, you know, monographs are expensive to do, and there are a number of um, factors that contribute to those costs. Uh, among them, as Catherine mentioned, is, you know, typesetting. That's just one. Copy editing is a significant expense, too, especially if you want to do it well and you have a good stable of copy editors that you want to work with. Um, and there are also internal overheads that are involved in managing the process um, of, of publishing, publishing books. Um, so 
there are a number of studies, uh, as Kristen mentioned earlier, that are going to go into, you know, trying to calculate exactly what the cost of doing a monograph is. I feel like UC Press has done that exercise for ourselves. Um, but it'll be interesting to find out what else, you know, uh, comes out of those, those research projects. Okay, let's, let's move on to Charles, and then we'll, we'll have time for questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, I was uh, trying to describe my title, uh, AUL for Publishing, University of Michigan Library, and direct University of Michigan Press to um, Sean Sutton just now. Uh, and I was thinking back to a, an old Monty Python sketch, which is um, he was an Earl and an OBE, and that made him an earlobe. So that is, uh, that's for Martin. That's a special, special acknowledgement. Um, so... <laughs> We're very uh, grateful indeed to, to, the, uh, to the Mellon Foundation. Um, uh, this is an announcement of the grant that we received, and um, it's, uh, it's out on the web. It's a press release that went out on Friday. Um, what I want really to do here is to take a step back, however, um, and as I'll refer to at the end, uh, my colleague Jeremy Morse, um, Director of Publishing Technology, is also here, and he's doing a poster this evening uh, which will be much clearer about the details of this. Uh, but essentially, um, uh, the development of a new platform that will enable the publication and preservation of digitally enriched humanities monographs. Um, and this is a collaborative project with uh, four other university presses and their parent libraries or um, associated libraries, uh, Indiana, Minnesota, Northwestern, and Penn State, each institution will contribute a case study publication. And the crucial thing about this project is it's all about leveraging existing library infrastructure. And the particular infrastructure that we're leveraging is the Hydra Fedora framework. But I do want to take a step back, and I want to um, observe something that I know many of you will have observed as well, which is whenever you talk to faculty in the humanities, you will find now that they are digital scholars. And these are people who do not self-identify as digital humanists. And here is a group of four faculty members at University of Michigan who just happened to be on the editorial board, the executive committee of University of Michigan Press. And below each one, I've indicated when they, when they introduce themselves, this is how they talk about the research that they're doing. And this is digital scholarship, but none of these people call themselves a digital humanist. So rich, rich digital research. And then at the point of publication, they have to flatten that work to fit within the boundaries of a print-type presentation, even if that's a digital PDF, as, uh, as, as Kristen uh, referenced. That is not a rich publication format. So this is, um, this is uh, an article which I think extremely highly of. Many of you will know it by Jennifer Vinapal and Monica McCormick. And they describe an issue related to this particular problem, which they describe as the faculty website problem. And that is that library uh, publishers um, are receiving more and more of these kinds of um, vaguely articulated requests. We have digital stuff and we don't know what to do with it. And then there's a reference interview that happens that elicits certain patterns of infrastructure that are needed. Um, and in that, this very fine article, you'll see some really interesting practical strategies for how to triage that material and actually convert it into infrastructure development needs. So the faculty website problem is the problem that we're trying to address. So when that conversation happens, what are the current publisher options for the what can I do with my associated stuff question? So here are some suggestions about ways that publishers are dealing with this. And I should say that um, 
it's an interesting situation in that uh, university presses, and we did a little survey of university press directors as we prepared for this grant. Um, university presses split pretty evenly on whether they feel they're getting this question. Um, and I'm trying to puzzle through why that is. And I think often it's because we don't ask the right questions. Uh, our acquisitions editors, when they're at conferences, they don't necessarily ask the digital question. And so faculty don't really think to talk to them about their digital needs. But this is the associated stuff question. These are the five um, uh, sort of potential options out there at the moment. And underlying all of this is the idea that what faculty are wanting to do is they want to link their narrative with data. So here are some examples. So here's an author website example from University of Minnesota Press. Here's a press website uh, example solution from University of Michigan Press. So this is um, uh, a, 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 an archaeology text. Um, the author wants to link to a catalog. Um, the solution that we currently have is to create a, uh, a, a section on our press website. Here's an institutional repository solution, and this will be familiar to many of you. I think this is a, a really fantastic area for library press collaboration. It's a great strategic opportunity. Um, this is uh, a Routledge book, and it's a Chapman University institution repository. So these relationships are often happening um, with um, publishers that aren't from the same institution. When a faculty member is fortunate enough to be at a university like Nebraska, which has a really developed digital humanities center, there are options there. So this is a University of Nebraska press book and a Nebraska um, website uh, created by the digital humanities center there. And then in certain fields in the humanities, there are disciplinary platforms. So this is ethnomusicology. This is an Indiana University press book and uh, the ethnomusicology um, uh, multimedia initiative developed with funding from the Mellon Foundation uh, and now uh, led by Temple University and Indiana University. But that's, this is kind of a, I think this is a minority uh, option. So each of these different solutions currently um, raises a number of different challenges. The extent and stability of integration and linkages. Uh, one of the things is the lack of granularity of the linkages that can be made. In fact, in many of those examples, it's interesting that you actually won't see a reference on the press website to the fact there is even a supplemental um, section at all. And you probably, you may see a reference back, but it's, linkages are just not happening, and certainly not happening in a me meaningful way. So um, that's the first one. And stability, I should say, with the author website issue, any press that's willing to print the author website address in their book is risking um, a, 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 a not found error almost immediately. Um, appearance and functionality of presentation, you saw in the Chapman IR example. I mean, institutional repositories are not great at customized presentation generally, but that is a branding association that um, faculty want. And functionality wise, so often these are materials you have to download and then manipulate um, offline. Replicability of software development, uh, a huge issue around producing customized solutions that cannot be repurposed, especially in digital humanity centers. Uh, integration into production and distribution workflows. So this is a phasing problem. If you have two partners working together, when does the press get the links to embed in their narrative? Um, and uh, you know, how do you phase all that? And then at the distribution point, how do you make sure that the associated platform, associated supplementary materials are discoverable to the same degree that the narrative is? And then aggregation and comparability of usage stats. I'm, I'm very encouraged by um, the, you know, the, the emphasis that Kristen put at the start on usage stats. I mean, this is our currency, the currency of open access, the currency of sustainable open access are rich usage statistics which are comparable. And we have to be very, very conscious of that. And I was pleased to see that in Catherine's presentation, too. So the nice thing about the faculty website um, problem is it's a wonderful, wonderful example for press library collaboration. Because you do have two very, very complementary sets of um, skills. 
and uh, infrastructure. University presses, um, I would suggest, are expert in shaping narrative. Um, they're focused on presentation and functionality, very oriented towards replicable production processes and workflows. Very importantly, they have great links to the information supply chain. And the information supply chain, we cannot underestimate the power of uh, Yankee Book Peddler, of Amazon, etc. of all these commercial entities who we risk disintermediating as we move to an open access future and at our peril. Uh, how we get a business model that works for them um, for dealing with open access materials is a real problem, I think. And where uh, university presses have to be interested in metrics because they have to justify their existence on, uh, on their campuses. They have to uh, justify their existence to authors, uh, to funders. And then the academic library, increasingly expert in managing research data, um, dedicated to stable identifiers and long-term access. Uh, in most cases, resources and skills to develop technology infrastructure, incredibly linked into preservation infrastructure, so things like Deepen, Hattie Trust, etc. And also very interested in metrics of impact. So a great complementarity here. So as I said, um, Jeremy will have a poster um, this afternoon, and so I've just reproduced a diagram that's way too small for any of you to read, but looks kind of impressive. And we stole this diagram for um, our um, AUL for IT, Morris York, um, who has terrific, um, a terrific vision and also knows how to use Graffle, which we don't. So what this shows, however, is that um, this is actually a diagram that shows the University of Michigan Library's commitment to Hydra Fedora. So we are currently in a situation where we have a lot of different platforms at work. We run a DSpace institution repository. Uh, we have our customized um, publication platform, uh, DLXS, Digital Library Extension Service, um, which is over a decade old now. We have um, Drupal instances, we have custom PHP instances, et cetera. So the aim is to move as a library, as a whole institution, with University of Michigan Press as part of the library to Hydra Fedora. And that is what that um, shows. So those things, the nice um, bubbly sort of things, the things that look like, I don't know what they look like. But anyhow, those things, those are heads um, to uh, a Hydra Fedora um, underlay, which is connected to a preservation um, and reuse network underneath. So we are looking for names for this thing. Um, I, um, Jeremy's been explained to me how we can use internal names, but uh, we must be sure never to sort of let them dominate the platform. So we're looking for names, so that would be lovely if you have any ideas. Um, this is five case studies. Um, the five case studies from the partner institutions you see at the bottom are deliberately chosen to illustrate a wide range of sort of challenges that we might have. Um, so uh, they range from um, uh, projects where there is a strong requirement for access restriction, for example, to other projects where there are a lot of intellectual property challenges, for example, Russian film clips, um, right the way through to a project uh, at University of Michigan. The project we've chosen is one where we're um, trying to explore what narrative and data look like when they're merged. So the Gabby E publication project will not have any print component. Um, it's going to be an entirely online University of Michigan Press publication. Um, some of the activities, so this is not just a programming challenge in any way. Um, it's definitely a user experience issue. Rights clearance is a huge part of um, the issue that we're going to be facing. Um, the organization of data and uh, trying to um, uh, you know, get some data hygiene um, out of our, our scholarly authors is going to be a big issue. And then there's a business planning, sustainability planning process also going on. So at the end of the project, and this is a three-year project, what we aim to end up with is um, definitely a nice open source code packet for reuse by other institutions who are working on Hydra Fedora. But also, uh, we will look at the sustainability of a hosted platform solution um, for other, um, for smaller institutions who would prefer to outsource uh, that um, activity. 
So this is uh, where you can see more and where you can talk to us. We would love to hear from you. Um, and uh, we would love to find a way of keeping anybody, especially in the hydro community, um, up to date and informed and um, uh, tapping into your expertise. And we also do have a library um, uh, technology advisory group, including Kate McCready, who's here from Minnesota. So um, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to taking questions. I, I also will take any burning questions. And then perhaps we should all come up here right, and share the microphone. So are there any questions about this particular project? that anybody really wants to get out of their systems. Great. I was going to refer any difficult questions to Eric Van Rin as well, but uh, um, okay, so maybe we should.